Good morning. It is April 12th, 2024, and it feels like we all need to start looking for rafts, floaties, anything that can get us through the need to get out of all the water that's falling on the ground. Uh, this is the third OSU 13 times of the year. Online, we've got Dr. Xiao Wei Wu, Dr. Dave Gardner, and Dr. Tyler Carr. Uh, the wet and cooler temperatures that we've had this week have most certainly allowed for uh, a slowdown in activity, as well as an increase in some of the problems that we would see uh, tied to particularly some of the pathogens with those cooler wet temperatures. Um, first up today, we've got Dr. Gardner. Take it away, Dr. Gardner, with the weed update. All right. Good morning, everybody. And yeah, um, it is. it has been cooler this week, but that's relatively speaking. The month is still running a little bit above normal temperature-wise, but if you've seen the forecast, we're going to go into the 70s next week. And with all of the uh, uh, soil moisture, it's going to be perfect conditions for crabgrass to be germinating. And this is the map provided by GDD Tracker as of this morning, which shows that we are now late for the application of pre-emergence herbicides. And given the conditions that are necessary for crabgrass to germinate, I can pretty much guarantee that we will see those next week. And so um, I would say continue using what you're using with caution. In other words, um, if you have a whole bunch of crabgrass germinating, germinating in your areas now, um, know that uh, most of our pre-emergence herbicides, with the exception of the liquid form of dithiopyr, are not going to be effective. Um, that said, not all of the crabgrass germinates in April, and so I usually have good success, even if there's a couple of crabgrass plants. When I put out a pre-emergence herbicide, it's going to prevent subsequent plants from germinating, and some of those earlier germinating crabgrass plants will often succumb to a frost, assuming that we will have a frost yet this month. Um, but my point is, is that um, it's, it's about time to be wrapping up your crabgrass pre-emergence applications. Uh, now, last time we were talking about crabgrass pre-emergence herbicides versus uh, overseeding, and we said that uh, with the majority of our products, it's just not a good idea, right? Um, because those pre-emergence herbicides will effectively control your turf grass seedlings also for up to four months, depending on the product. One exception being tenacity, which is safe at seeding time. But the one cautionary note that I made last time was that if you have severe crabgrass pressure, then sometimes tenacity or mesotrione, depending on the grass that you're attempting to establish, even the, the mesotrione might not be enough. So here's an example of where we seeded perennial ryegrass um, in an area where we had tilled up and we knew that we had severe crabgrass pressure. And you see that even though we applied the, the mesotrione correctly, um, that uh, we still had a lot of crabgrass pressure. And yes, you can go back and you can spray tenacity again um, to get some control, but ryegrass establishes relatively quickly. And so uh, we also did this test with Kentucky bluegrass and that did not go well, okay? So um, my point is, is that, uh, you know, with the spring overseeding operations, mesotrione is a valuable tool, but just know that if you have areas where you know that you've had a lot of crabgrass pressure and you're going to attempt to establish Kentucky bluegrass from seed, I'm not saying that you're gonna have something like this. This is kind of a worst case scenario kind of thing, but Last time when I said you might have less trouble if you avoid seeding during the month of May, this is an example of that. So here is uh, Kentucky bluegrass germinating on bare soil during the month of July. And you see that there's not a single crabgrass plant competing because, well, um, there's not a lot of crabgrass germinating at that time and the herbicide was plenty effective then. So that, that was the point that I was making a couple of weeks ago with uh, seeding and the use of mesotrione. Now, I like this picture. I took this yesterday right outside of the building that I work in. It's kind of a beauty is in the eye of the beholder thing. If you notice here, there are two different kinds of plants that each have two um, that, that, that have light pink flowers on them. So one of them is something that we plant on purpose, which is called spotted dead nettle. So this is in a landscaping bed. And then the other one is purple dead nettle, which is a weed that we will see occasionally in turf because it's a winter annual. Now, if you manage landscape beds and you see something like this, you're kind of out of luck because we have no selective post-emergence herbicides that will control the, the winter annual weed and spare your ground cover. However, if you are in turf, remember that we do have options for the control of winter annual weeds. Ideally, you would want to do that before they flower and set seed. 
And remember also that you need to use some of the, uh, um, how should I say it, more potent herbicides that we have, you know, like some of those uh, four-way combinations that include preferably esters, um, but again, use caution with those if uh, temperatures are, uh, um, you know, in the upper 70s, like they're forecast to be next week. Now, something else that um, has come up a lot in emails that I'm getting is, you know, what is this grass? Um, and, they, um, and folks will send me pictures. And generally speaking, if you have grasses that are growing much quicker than the intended turf grass at this time of the year, they're going to be cool season grasses, right? So none of the warm season grasses are really doing anything yet. Crabgrass, if you have it, it's tiny little one leaf seedlings. Uh, I went to our field center yesterday, and as of yesterday, there was no field pass palum that was emerging yet. Um, those will be very coarse leaves that will be poking out of the ground. And so any time that you see grasses like this, they're going to be cool season in nature. And so the important thing is to figure out whether it's an annual, like the picture on the left, which is annual ryegrass, or a perennial, um, like the orchard grass that's on the right. If it's a perennial, we have very few selective options. If it's an annual, you can kind of ignore it, right? Because it will eventually go away on its own. But this is that time of the year where a lot of the other grass species are more visible because the bluegrass and the ryegrass are not necessarily growing as quickly. So some of these other weedy grasses um, get kind of a head start on the season and grow in cooler temperatures. And so annual bluegrass uh, being one of those, uh, we do have some Selective options, depending on where you're trying to manage the annual bluegrass. So ethafumisate has been around for a very long time, um, but amacarbazone, methiazolin if you're on golf courses, and then bispyrobac sodium, um, that was on the market and then it was off the market and now it's on the market again. But amacarbazone or exonerate um, is labeled for basically everywhere but greens for the control of annual bluegrass. Um, the control is somewhat variable, as you would expect, trying to selectively remove annual bluegrass. But in some of my trials, I've seen up to 90% control of annual bluegrass with exonerate. Timing is everything um, with this product. Uh, there's, there's a specific schedule of applications that you need to make and um, you know, use degree days in order to uh, uh, time when it is that you would make the first application. But the picture on the left is uh, fairway height bent grass prior to um, running the program, and then the picture on the right is after. And so, again, you can theoretically get really good control with this product, and it is also labeled for high cut turf. Um, another grass that we're uh, seeing a lot right now is uh, Poa trivialis or rough blue grass. And so this is the one that uh, will go dormant as soon as the temperature goes above 80 degrees in the summertime. And um, when you see a picture like this, the classic question is, is, well, what disease caused this or what insect caused this? And it's just the rough bluegrass going dormant. So these are pictures of rough bluegrass on a fairway um, golf course outside of Dayton. And you can see that um, while it looks like there's a disease or an insect, if you dig down in there, you've got um, plump, uh, perfectly healthy stolons. Uh, ready to regenerate leaf temp uh, tissue when the temperature goes lower. And so this is one that can be kind of annoying. Um, now that said, uh, bispyrobac sodium, I mentioned that uh, it is labeled for annual bluegrass control. It's also labeled for rough bluegrass. And so this is one potential selective option. Um, just came back on the market this year after a, a, a brief hiatus. It is labeled for fairways, tees, athletic fields, and also lawns, commercial and residential. It is safe on perennial ryegrass and tall fescue. The tricky thing is, is that you may see injury to Kentucky bluegrass that may be substantial depending on the cultivar of Kentucky bluegrass that you are uh, managing. And so that is the tricky thing with this particular product. Um, I did get an email from a gentleman last week that uh, I, I, I'm paraphrasing here, but it was basically, you know, based on my experience with this product since the year 2005, I predict that this is going to be on the market for about a year and then it's going to become a southern herbicide. I don't know, okay, that we certainly have precedence for that, right? So Certainty herbicide was released in the year 2007 and it was available in cool season turf for a year and then it became a warm season product. Um, I would phrase it this way. Uh, if you were going to, if you've got rough bluegrass that is spotty and all over the lawn uh, and you were going to just resort to using glyphosate and renovating anyway, it's like, why not give it a try? The worst that can happen is, is that you'll go back with the glyphosate and 
you know, you'll, you'll renovate again that way. But, um, you know, just know that this is an option that uh, if you are having an issue with rough bluegrass that you could uh, uh, consider investigating. Uh, another thing about this product is that uh, there are some broadleaf weeds that are labeled. So this isn't a classic chemistry that also affords broadleaf weed control. It's just the price point is a little bit higher. So we don't normally use it for that purpose. But for resistance management, this is a product that could also help us in that area as well. Ed, that's what I have for this week. Uh, Dave, I got a couple of questions here. So <clears throat> the media try on is appearing on homeowner products in uh, Home Depot and Lowe's, correct? Yeah, and I think primarily those are granular in nature. And as with many of our herbicides, the liquid formulation tends to be more effective post-emergence compared to the granular formulation. But if you're using it at establishment for pre-emergence weed control, then granular and liquid formulations tend to be pretty similar in their efficacy. The, the one thing I, I want to bring up is, and this was a point that was raised to me, that don't confuse the mesotrione's efficacy or longevity with some of your traditional crabgrass prevention products, right? That there is a difference there. Yes, um, and that's kind of complicated too because um, based on work that I've done, it appears that this is a product that has accelerated microbial decomposition when it is applied to turf grass um, because you have a lot more microbial activity associated with the thatch and a mature stand of turf. When you apply it to bare soil, you can get a residual that will last for a couple of months at least. In turf, it tends to not provide as long of a residual um, uh, uh, control when you apply it by itself. Now, curiously, if you apply it in combination with another pre-emergence herbicide, it will tend to enhance the pre-emergence control compared to the product by itself. So either prodiamine or dithiapyr, but as a standalone pre-emergence herbicide, it tends to not work as well in mature turf. And I think the microbial decomposition might be a way of explaining that. Again, on bare soil for an establishment or an overseeding, it's it's a really good long lasting product. Right, that was just one clarification I want to bring up. Uh, anyone got any other questions for Dave there? Okay, Dr. Wu. Good morning. Um, last week, um, I'm um, not last week, the previous time I mentioned about um, uh, ABW, the antibiotic wavel monitoring, and also using um, indicated plants such as Vastanthia and Eastern Red Bud um, for adult activities. And so um, in this week, the Vastanthia has passed uh, half gold, half grain, uh, which is uh, um, like um, the time where we um, uh, suggest for the peak adult activities. And uh, some of those plants actually uh, reach about 80 to 90% of the grain. And Eastern red bud is in mid to uh, nearly full bloom. And uh, so in our know, monitoring, it looks like um, our traps are still catching the adult uh, moving out from the overwintering sites. And uh, with uh, um, one of the trap and set up in Columbus area, I got 70 uh, in a trap last week, and um, the traps in, in um, Cincinnati area, we saw reduced numbers, about 14 to uh, 20 weevils per trap. Um, when we did the dissection of the weevils uh, reproductive system, we found that um, there's still some eggs uh, in the canix, but um, about up to 30% of those uh, weevils, uh, females, um, should have fewer uh, sperms in the spermatheca and also um, uh, reduce all sites um, that used to produce eggs. So that all this indicate that we are going to, we are right now in the peak adult activity and going to pass the uh, peak egg name soon. So um, um, the recently the weather is not um, not cooperating with us. Um, so um, the very frequent rainfalls had may have interrupted the treatment plants. So if you are not able to uh, apply the adult uh, treatments in the um, in the past uh, one or two weeks. You may still do so in early next week. Uh, looks like the weather is looks nice. Um, if after next week, I assume that um, the um, insecticides are not going to work well um, for targeting the adult stage because they have, the weevils have 
pretty much by that time should have finished the job and laying the eggs. Um, but if you miss that, still that's okay. Um, you can still apply uh, larvae sites, um, the insects that is targeting the early Easter larvae a few weeks later um, before the damage occurs. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Wu. Dr. Carr. Okay, guys, let me share. I'm going to share my screen really quick. I just want to share some of the uh, different, some a couple different um, questions that I've received over the last week or two. Um, one of these is a Kentucky bluegrass sod farm in central Ohio. Um, and they noticed this type of damage that we're seeing here um, last summer following um, a drought stretch. And so I, you know, I, some of you uh, may have seen this, uh, Dr. Nangle and Dr. Gardner uh, may have seen this in a group text I sent around. You know, originally I thought there's a low area here maybe holding some moisture and, and uh, contributing to just different um, rates of spring green up. Uh, but I went out to this facility this week and noticed that these areas were in fact higher than a lot of the, the lower areas, uh, the areas that were green. And one of these fields, and I can't remember which photo it may, it, it's not this photo. It's a, Let's see if it's the next one. Um, yeah, this field here was planted um, in fall of 23. No, sorry, fall of 22, late fall of 22. And so it wasn't fully established by the time the drought hit in uh, late spring, early summer last year. And so it, it seems like it just never got completely established in these areas. And so um, you know, temperatures haven't really been conducive for it to, to grow in much, um, this spring, and they also don't have irrigation on this field. So it seems like this is something that, that, um, I've heard that others are experiencing with Kentucky bluegrass. That's, that wasn't irrigated during that drought stress period. We, what was it? Three or four weeks that we had a, a nice hard drought. Um, in late spring last year, that sounds about right, doesn't it? Three or four weeks. Yeah, late spring, early summer. Yeah, yeah, late spring, early summer. And uh, you know, this is one of the challenges we have with Kentucky bluegrass, not uh, non-irrigated Kentucky bluegrass here. Um, that's why you know we're seeing a lot of people opt for tall fescue or other turf grass species in in uh, in Ohio. So my recommendation to these guys was to. Uh, um, apply for a uh, quick release fertilizer this spring and and hopefully it um, continues to to fill in uh, this spring before we hit some some warmer temperatures. We have conducted some soil nutrient analysis, but it, it doesn't look like anything is um, deficient or, or off there. Uh, something I received earlier this week um, is this picture from an extension educator. Um, the, the homeowner here uh, was like, hey, what in the world is going on with my lawn? Um, and what it looks like here, just from my first point, my first glance is, looks like there's warm season grass here. And um, this photo here, it's the same thing. And, you know, I, I'm thinking, okay, if, if he thinks that something's wrong here, he must have never seen this present. So I asked when, when the homeowner moved in, he said last summer. So it makes sense. We, somebody likely planted some warm season grass, either Bermuda grass or zoysia grass. It kind of looks like dormant Bermuda grass to me. Um, that, that doesn't have a, or that a uh, pre-emergent herbicide wasn't applied to in the fall. Um, and, you know, I, most people would, would think that this is just dead turf, but it, it seems to be just dormant Bermuda grass. I don't know if the homeowner is interested in keeping the Bermuda grass or killing it out. If, if you have a situation like this um, and you want to get rid of it, wait until it greens up um, and start applying uh, glyphosate um, probably on 28 day intervals, Dave, before um, opting to reseed in the fall, two or three applications. 
hopefully we'll get rid of this uh, Bermuda grass. Yes, maybe. with with care taken around the trees too. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, interesting, interesting thing to see here, and you can also see that it probably it falls um, close to the street here and uh, around this area, and I would expect over time that this would just continue to move closer uh, to this road. So that's uh, those are some of the things that I that we've seen um, as temperatures warm. Uh, we're going to see this area fill in uh, with green turf. Um, but we're kind of in this yo-yo cycle of weather. Um, and, and I know many of us are anxious to, to, for uh, us to get some more consistent weather so we can have our management practices be more consistent. So I'm going to add, I'm going to pop on this if you got, unless you guys have anything else to add. Yeah, can you go back to that, Tyler, for a second? Yeah. Mm -hmm. One thing that probably needs to be brought up, this is why the new homeowner obviously is like, what's going on? This isn't necessarily a bad idea, particularly when you mm -hmm. look at this, the slope of the hill. That probably was an area where it was not holding water. <clears throat> and if it's south facing, which I'm not sure, Tyler, I don't know whether you found that out or not. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure. That probably was struggling in the heat of the summer. So mm -hmm. for people who are like, well, why would you do that? The op the opportunity there is that they're putting in a turf grass that's much more tolerant of, of heat, high temperatures. And also, it's going to not need as much water in that period of time in the summer where we are under a lot of stress. So the previous homeowner, while it doesn't necessarily look ideal right now, was not doing something that was necessarily a, a bad idea. This this is a, a pretty smart opportunity that they've taken to try and, and improve the situation there. Yeah, that, that's a good point. And uh, one thing to add on that is that they probably planted this grass somewhere in this line around here. They had cool season grass. They probably planted it somewhere in this line. Bermuda grass does really poorly under shade. And so it's going to continue to grow and overtake cool season turf during the summer to a point where it's, it has enough sunlight. And so it, this is why you see this cool season turf around these trees. Um, and it makes for a pretty good uh, line of where the Bermuda grass is performing adequately throughout the the summer um, we see this you see this a lot as you get further south in the country a lot of mixed lawns with cool and warm season grasses in these situations especially with um, as much shade as this lawn gets you will see that in cleveland believe it or not um people have the tried Bermuda's green for two months well it may, it may, may be more noisy than bermuda but it will be yellow at this uh, time of year which obviously people think what's going on but um, mm -hmm. people are trying things to reduce inputs okay Dr. Yeah. Carr thank you uh, as we wrap it up uh, we need to reach out turf at osu.edu is the email address and then the twitter handles osu turf osu ati turf and then podcast turf team times uh, and of course we post this on YouTube, uh, uh, free to air. So we are better than any of your streaming or cable companies. With that, we will see you all in two weeks' time. Hopefully, we didn't all get washed away.